Bueno, buen día. Buen día a todos. Uh, first of all, I ask our guest, Professor Jackson, to allow me some words in, in Catalan for the constituency. Uh, Estem a la vigésimo cuarta lliçó de economía. La primera la va fer Kenneth Arrow, fa exactament l'any 90. He procurat cada any triar un tema i un conferenciant destacat. El ser de la elecció a vegades ha estat premiat amb un Nobel, reconegut a posteriori. Sembla que són set els premis Nobel que han passat per aquí. No és l'únic acte inaugural que fem avui. A la tarda, a les set, hi ha un acte de reconeixement als delegats, als millors estudiants, al guanyador dels premis de la ciutat de Baix, als que esteu tots invitats. Cal destacar que aquest acte és possible gràcies al patrocini de laboratoris doctor Esteve, representat aquí pel senyor Urbieta, a la seva dereta. I, bé, el first de Aix, before the movie, eso, uns agraïments a tres blocs de persones que són fonamentals per nosaltres. Primer, un agraïment als estudiants, especialment als de primer curs, que en guany són 652, 20 més que l'any passat. Afortunadament, millor compensats, millor agrupats, perquè tenim un grup a la doble de 90, i amb la convergència en la nota de tall ja assolida, el que és important, perquè insisteix en que el que atreu ha de ser la marca de la facultat i els graus són polivalents. Per tant, no hauria, ja hem aconseguit que ja hauria d'haver aconseguit fa temps, que és que la nota de tall... Agrair, a part dels de primer, a mi m'agradaria aquests estudiants de Catifa Vermella, o sigui, els que es preocupen per fer coses, els que fan associacions de qualsevol mena, els que participen en la societat de debats, o aquells estudiants que són mentors dels seus companys. Gràcies. Gràcies també al personal. Una facultat funciona si la biblioteca funciona, si la informàtica funciona, si la secretaria de facultat funciona, si l'oficina d'inserció laboral funciona i està funcionant. L'any passat es van subscriure més de mig miler de convenis de pràctiques, un augment del 60% respecte al curs anterior. Aquest curs és possible que doblem aquesta xifra. Portem 160 convenis de pràctica signats en un mes i mig. Això multiplicat per 6 ens dona més de 1.000 convenis. Gràcies també a l'Oficina de Mobilitat i al professor Àngel Gil, que ens permetrà exportar gairebé 300 estudiants d'intercanvi de la facultat i rebre més de 300 del món. Molt important insistir en els que rebem. La forma més casolana i més a l'abast de tothom de fer networking és conèixer aquests estudiants que venen de 30 o 40 països del món. I ja, finalment, gràcies als professors i dins dels professors particularment els associats que representen la meitat de la docència de la nostra facultat i que són els que pateixen les pitjors condicions laborals i que són insubstituïbles, perquè la biologia molecular l'explica un acadèmic, però la cirurgia l'ha d'explicar un cirurgià, l'ha d'explicar un professional. I aquest agraïment, aquest any, s'ha estès als premis de docència. Dos professors associats, Antoni Durant Sindreu i Xavier Puig, han estat premiats com millors docents. I gràcies també, particularment, als professors que destaquen en recerca, les dues European Research Grants, Advanced Grants, de Jordi Galí, Jan Ithout, els professors que surten als mitjans, que participen a la vida social, que estan als òrgans reguladors que són ara caps de competència de la Unió Europea. Tots aquests, els tres col·lectius, estudiants, personal i professors, permeten que la facultat aquesta sigui de forma descarada la número un d'Espanya. El rànquing més seriós, que és el de la Fundació Banco Bilbao Vizcaya Argentària, a mi vie, i que es pot consultar a u-rànquing.es, en situar les totes les nostres titulacions absolutament al davant. I curiosament arrosseguem també a les escoles escrites i a l'Esti. I en rànquings internacionals mantenim la novena posició europea. Sigui el rànquing de recerca de Tilburg o sigui el rànquing d'economia i econometria que fa QS. 
Per tant, gràcies a tots els que feu possible aquesta situació. And now I, I will give the floor to Professor Humberto Llevador. He is the Deputy Dean for Academic Affairs. Uh, Professor Humberto Llevador, he will present our speaker and, uh, and share the, quest, the, the questions periods after all. So, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure hmm, to introduce uh, Mark Jackson today here for, the, for this issue of the economy. Uh, Professor Jackson is the William Everold Professor of Economics at Stanford University. Previously, he was at Caltech, and before that, he was also in uh, Kellogg Graduate School of Management. Uh, Professor Jackson is especially known for his contributions to uh, the theory of social networks and its applications to economics, and he's going to talk about that today uh, during the lecture. He published in 2008 a book that was called Social and Economic Networks that became a reference hmm, for, this, uh, for this literature. And related to this topic, he has written on social mobility, information diffusion, and even microfinance loans in, in a recent paper that, uh, that appeared in, in Science. But besides his research I mean, on, on social networks, he has had relevant contributions on many other topics. So, so I just say few of them, political economy and voting, game theory, mechanism design, options, learning and cognition, uh, and I'm sure I'm missing some, hmm? including his recent incursions on macroeconomics and dynamics. Okay, so, uh, so, but, I mean, you can say many things about his quality as a researcher, but besides that, he's also a great teacher, okay? Uh, this year is the recipient of the Dean's Awards of Distinguished, uh, Distinguished Teaching in Humanities and Science at and Stanford, and he has already run in three different MOOCs, okay? One on, on social and economic networks with thousands or hundreds of thousands of students, uh, and two on, on game theory, okay? Uh, so, great researcher, dedicated teacher, and also uh, a great sportsman, okay? Uh, so he started hmm, as the, uh, the captain of the Pommel Horse team in, Stam in, in Princeton, okay? And if I'm not mistaken, he currently uh, cycles more than 100 kilometers a week. So actually, you told me that more than 100 hmm, by far, and practice triathlon. So it really keeps true to the motto of men sana in corpore sana, okay? So uh, without further ado, let me just hmm, give the floor to Professor Jackson and thank him for, for being here. So first, first of all, thank you to Umberto for that kind introduction and, and also thank you very much to uh, Dean Orton and, and Jose Luis uh, Rubieta for, for making this all possible and for having me here. It's, it's a great pleasure to be part of an important opening ceremony of a university and, and uh, of this um, uh, new academic year. And I think there's always excitement at this point in time of all the things that one can be learning in the, over time. And, and what I want to be talking about today is a topic which is very dear to my heart and puts economics in perspective of human and social interactions. And the idea here is that, you know, when we, th when we think about human behavior, uh, humans are social animals. We interact with other individuals, and those interaction structures are very important in determining how we behave. And it, over the last decade, we've seen a, a ra very rapid growth of social media, things like Facebook, Twitter, all kinds of different ways that we interact, and those things are, are changing the way we're interacting. And, and it has consequences. And what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is, is just how we can understand as social scientists and as researchers and as people in the world how social structure and the way we interact actually impacts how we behave. So what we believe, how we vote, how we choose products, uh, what, what economic actions we take. So the, in, in terms of economics and networks, there are sort of two different important interactions that have occurred. One is that in order to understand economics, 
It's not as if we interact usually in, in anonymous and large market ways, the way that we sort of classically think of supply and demand in, in a textbook, but we actually interact often with other individuals, even within companies or, or across companies, uh, across countries. Um, these patterns of interaction are very important and access about how we, how we find out information about which jobs we get, um, which products we buy, how we uh, f share favors among friends, whether we need a loan from a friend, um, what, what opinions we form, whether or not we invest in educating, do, you know, why are you here in terms of uh, pursuing an education, how did that depend on what your peers did uh, earlier on. Um, and so, so a whole series of questions will be important to take social structure into account. And on the other hand, the kinds of tools and the ways in which an economist thinks about the world are also useful in understanding networks. So we can disentangle fairly complicated data using economic modeling techniques and using techniques from, from economic theory. Um, we can be begin to make predictions about how things will evolve and how people will behave. And so that's sort of the over uh, underlying theme of, of the work I've been interested in, in over the last decade or so is the social structure has consequences and we need to understand that in order to really make uh, deep predictions about human behavior in economic uh, situations. Okay, so let me start with just uh, pointing something out which I think is fairly uh, basic to, to complexity theory and to understanding networks. And let's suppose that, that we're just in a, a society of just 30 people. So we just have 30 people in a room. And we want to know what's, how they're interacting. Well, if we begin to think about how many different patterns of interaction we could have with just 30 individuals, there is a huge set of different possible network structures that could exist. Right? So let's just suppose all we're interested in doing is saying, who is friends with whom? So we just want to match out ones and zeros of who's a friend with whom. Well, each person could have 29 possible friendships, right? So I, I could have 29 friends, I might have zero friends, I might have 12 friends. So each individual could have 29 different possibilities. And then person two, not counting the friendship that we've already counted with person one, could have 28 additional and so forth. So when you add those all up, there's 435 possible relationships could, that could exist in a small society of just 30 people. And now when you begin to think about how many networks that translates into, each one of those relationships could be present or it might not be present, right? So it might be there, it might not be there. So what does that translate into? There's 435 possible friendships in that world. And when you look at, you know, how many could be present, it could be a zero or a one, you end up with the number of possible networks just on a society of 30 people is two to the 435th power. Okay, and how big is two to, you know, 435, that's not that big, but two to the 435 is a big number. How big a number is it? Well, the estim estimates for the number of atoms in the universe is somewhere between two to the 158th and two to the 246th. And, and don't ask me exactly how they figure out those numbers. <laughs> uh, uh, Wikipedia is a wonderful thing, so those numbers come from Wikipedia. But, but, but basically the idea is that there's a lot of possible networks, even with a very small society. And so that means it's going to be difficult for us to describe a, a world just by saying, oh, that's the network that, that we observe. And so we have to have ways of describing how do people interact that simplify away from all this, this large uh, complexity there. So the way in which we tend to capture relationships and, and describe networks are going to sort of have different levels. And one is going to be sort of a global level. We can talk about how connected a society is. Is it a densely connected society where lots of people talk to lots of others? Or is it something where there's very few connections and not much communication going on? So we're going to have basic connectivity or density. That'll be one dimension that we might describe a society on. Um, another would be segregation patterns. Is it true that people are talking across groups, that people mix very evenly across the society, or is it a highly segregated society, that, that certain people only talk to other ones and there's not much communication across groups? That's going to have important consequences. So that's another way in which we might describe a society. And a third way in which you might des describe a society is in terms of local patterns. So how many friends of, my f uh, of mine are friends with each other? 
do, the, do we know each other in tight cliques or, or do I tend to know people that don't know each other at all? Um, how important are certain individuals? Uh, how do we describe uh, whether people are more important than other individuals in terms of their connections? So we can talk about different ways of describing networks and what we'll do is simplify social structure into a series of very basic kinds of principles. And what I want to do in the lecture today is just go through and give you an example of each one of these and how it has some economic implications. So we'll just go through and look at, say, basic connectivity and what kinds of implications it might have for a society. And segregation patterns and what kinds of implications does that have for a society. And local patterns of interaction and what kinds of, of implications that might have for society. So three illustrations. And what I'm going to do with, is start with the connectivity and, and density, and I'll just talk about uh, contagion and diffusion, sort of a, a, a very basic thing that we're interested in on many different areas, not only economics, but also things like epidemiology, um, it, it, disease, other, other you know, flow of information, flow of new products, and so forth. Okay. So um, the density and also the distribution of, of how people are connected across the society is, is important in many applications. So will a flu spread? So if, you know, if we're, we're entering the flu season now, will we have an important flu that spreads around the world or will it be a fairly light flu season? That depends very much on the interaction patterns in an individual. How quickly does information flow through a network? Does it reach uh, different individuals easily or is it it's somehow hampered? Um, and, and, you know, one obvious kind of statement that you would expect is that higher density is going to lead to more contagion. So networks that have more connectivity, that's going to lead to easier spreads of ideas and so forth. And so let's have a quick look at that and then uh, understand that in a little more detail. So let me sh start by just showing you a picture of a network and trying to understand, you know, the things of, of connectivity and, and spread. This is a, a, a network that is a, a mapping of a school this is a high school in the United States, and the students, the little dots here are students, and they're co color-coded by, um, by gender, so uh, the pink nodes are females, the blue nodes are males, and in this case, this is um, data from Bierman, Moody, and Stovall, and in particular, what this is, there's a link between two individuals if they had a romantic relationship within a one-year period where they were being interviewed. Okay, so these are uh, romantic relationships, and you begin to see that there's a pattern here, right? So we have a network, um, there's a bunch actually down here, there's 63 pairs, there's a bunch of these pairs, but there's also a fairly large connected component here, right? So these are individuals who, who all had relationships uh, in, in some way, and, and there's a connected component. Um, so this would be an example of a, of, a, of a network, and in this particular situation, if information was spreading through this kind of network, it depends very much on where an idea would come in or a flu, et cetera. If it comes in in one part of the network, it might spread to a large part. If it comes into a smaller part of the network, it might not spread at all. So knowing exactly what this network looks like and how densely connected it is will give us an idea of whether this thing spreads widely, who it spreads to, which individuals are likely to hear about things, and, and a whole series of questions like that. Um, just to give you an idea of, you know, density of, of connections varies dramatically across application. So if we look at, uh, this is the romance network we just looked at. Um, the average degree, so I'll use this term degree quite a bit today. Degree means the number of connections that you have. So how many different friends do you have? In this case, how many romantic partnerships did you have? So degree just means your number of connections. And so here, um, with the romances, it's about 0.8. So on average, each student, there's a bunch of students who didn't have any romances, and, and some people had more than one. So 0.8 was the, the average over that data set. If you look at high school friendships, this is from work with Sergio Corini and, and Paolo Pin we did a few years ago. Um, high school friendships, close friends, about 6.5. So uh, people will have about 6.5 people that they would identify as close friends uh, typically in a year. Um, this is work I've been doing with Abhijit Banerjee, Arun Chandra Sikar, and Esther Duflo, where we look at uh, borrowing and lending behavior in southern India. So these are poor people who borrow and lend from each other. 
They need money, they don't have banks, they have to borrow uh, from each other. They borrow from about 3.2 other individuals in a given year. Um, you know, Co-authorships, these are scientific collaborations. It varies dramatically across fields. In economics, it's relatively small, 1.7. Biology, where you work in larger teams, about 15.5. And so that's going to have consequences for information flow. How many other people are you communicating with on a regular basis? How many people are you working closely with? Um, Facebook, people always ask about this, so I have to include it. Um, 120 is the, the average across all of Facebook. Um, so, so, you know, you see very different connectivity in, in different arenas, and that's going to have consequences. So, in terms of consequences, um, let's just take a look at, at a few different networks, and we can begin to see how patterns emerge. So, one thing that's very important, and, and this was actually discovered in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s by two mathematicians, uh, Erdash and Renyi, and what they looked at was, if you put down links at random in a, in a network, what does a network look like? And what they found was that a network changes very rapidly. So increasing the average number of connections per person, you get very rapidly from something which looks completely disconnected to something which is completely connected. So here if we have each person having on average a half a friend, so some people have friends, some people don't, you know, you get a smattering of connections and then a bunch of disconnected nodes. You increase this to 1.5, and then you get a network which actually looks somewhat reminiscent of what we saw in the romance network. It, it begins to take shape where you begin to see some component emerging, and then you see some isolated bits. So it, it starts to coalesce. By the time you get to 2.5 connections, so on average now people have 2.5 uh, partners, then suddenly you've, you're much more densely connected. You have the, the most, most people can reach other people via some path in the network. Information could spread from any person to any other person, except for a few here. And then by the time you get up to five here, it would be almost completely connected and fairly dense. Okay? And so as we change the different application and we change the network structure, the network coalesces very rapidly from just a little bit below a half to somewhere above three or four. We've, we've gone through what, what we might call a phase transition where we have disconnected groups to suddenly a, a widely connected um, society. Okay. Um, and so if you, if you look there at the number, you know, the fraction of people who are actually in the largest component, when you hit this number one, so if each person has on average one friendship, that's where it starts to take shape and you start to have people being able to reach other people via, via some path. And by the time you get to three, you're up to almost 95% of the people being able to reach other, everybody else in the society. And so you get this very rapid increase, right? And in Facebook, you know, the estimates are somewhere between 80 and, and 90 or more percent of people can reach each other. But there, you know, you, you have a lot of people who ha have, don't use things at all. But, but you get a very rapid increase here with a, a, a slight increase in degree, and you get a, a very rapid change in the structure of the network. Okay. And so this increased density um, basically leads to somewhat competing effects, and I'll, I'll talk about those in more detail. So on the one hand, contagions and f uh, information, other kinds of things can spread more, more further, more rapidly. But on the other hand, um, it also can affect behaviors in other kinds of ways. It might be that if I have more individuals that I'm in communication with, I don't talk to those people as often as I would if I had fewer people uh, that I'm talking to. So it might be that I, I have more friends, but I don't communicate with them as often as I would have if I had fewer friends. So there's sort of competing effects. That there's more reach, but there also could be less activity across any given link. Okay? And so let, let's just, but to see how the, I'll be very, very explicit here about how things might spread and figuring out, you know, say, information flow. Let's suppose we have a society that has a low density and another society that has a higher density and in those two societies, each one of them, we pick four people at random who get told about a new product. Okay, if there's a new product out, a, a new type of phone, et cetera, a new app, these four people hear about it in this society, these four people about, hear about it in this society, and they randomly talk to friends. So if each one of them, for instance, with a probability of half tells a given friend, then what would happen in this world, well, these three people don't have any friends, they're not gonna tell anybody, 
Um, this person has two friends, they tell one of the two, we get a little bit of spread in this society. In this society, these people have lots of friends, they start telling friends, we see very rapidly that, that we're going to have many more people informed. And then if we keep iterating on this process, you know, we're going to end up with a lot more density in, in of informed individuals and spread in this second higher density network than the first one. So that's going to be fairly obvious. The denser the network, the more rapid things can spread and, and the further, the, the higher percentage of the population that can end up being informed. So this is, is, is generally going to be true in situations if people are mapping out flus and trying to figure out how things interact. Situations where you look at grade schools, that's uh, a, a situation where lots of, of students have very close interactions with each other. They end up spreading the flu a lot. Um, societies where schools aren't in session have much lower spreads of flus than societies where, where you have schools in session. So the, the structure and the density of these interactions makes a big difference in, in the spread of, of information, of flus, and so forth. Okay. Let me give you then the second part, a, a, a twist. How does this come into economics? Well, for instance, in economics, we might be interested in financial contagions. So something I talked about a little bit in a seminar yesterday. I'll just give you a, a brief picture of it here. There we begin to have sort of competing effects. The more integrated the world becomes, the more the, uh, connections that different individuals, uh, organizations have with each other, the more diversified they become. That allows the world to have more interaction structure, more connectivity, which can lead to something impacting one spreading to other places. So that makes the world a smaller world in terms of this spread. But at the same time, if we look at having more partners, each company, country, and so forth might be less reliant on the others. So that we have these competing effects. And what that means is, we're, whereas when we look back at uh, this graph, just increasing density meant we, we increased the reach and the connectivity and possible spread. In this kind of world, we have competing effects. And if you go through then and work through contagion in this kind of world and increase the average number of partners in this world, you get that initial increase that you saw before. But then eventually, the fact that you're interacting with more and more partners means I have less of my portfolio or my exposure to any given individual other company that lowers the, the exposure and lowers the possibility of, say, a financial contagion. So when you look at these things, in economic settings, you can have competing effects. And then in this world, it means that you'd, you'd like to have either a really highly connected world or a low connected world. The, the worst situation is having a world with everybody has a few connections. They're not that well diversified, but the world is connected enough that things can spread. Okay? And so what does this mean? This means that in understanding things like financial contagions and interactions across individuals in a society, it's important for us to understand the social structure and understand how highly connected there is, uh, people are and exactly what the likelihood of interaction across different relationships is. And putting those things together will allow us to make predictions and understand things about you know, how, how much should we be worried about whether or not the U.S. Uh, um, legislatures can come to an agreement about uh, the debt ceiling tomorrow or today. So if, if they manage to do that, you know, if they don't, will, will we have large consequences in international markets tomorrow? How is that dependent on the structure? So these are questions we can begin to answer. And this is just a graph that I put up in the, the discussions yesterday. If you look at the world, you can begin to map out. These are cross-debt holdings in the uh, European Union, uh, how much of a given country's debt is held by another country. So 14% of Spain's uh, uh, debt is held in Germany and so forth. So you can begin to put numbers on these, you can begin to look at these in terms of economic content, and then you can begin to ask the same kinds of questions we were doing in terms of hypotheticals on uh, a contagion graph, you can begin to look at in an economic context as well. Okay, so that's sort of the first piece of the puzzle. And a very intuitive one, I think, for most of us, the idea that, that connectivity and density, higher density, leads to more potential contagion. Exactly how that plays out depends on the structure of the interactions, but that's fairly intuitive. So the second thing I want to talk about now are the segregation patterns. And the important, I, I think one of the most important things from our perspective 
in understanding segregation patterns in the world is that when we have a world that, that has tightly connected groups that don't interact with each other, that allows differences in behavior and differences in opinion and other kinds of things to persist in ways that don't happen in a more integrated world. And so let me talk a little bit about segregation patterns and how they exist in the world and then what the uh, important implications are. So there's a term called homophily that was, uh, comes out of the sociology literature. And it's actually a, a term uh, coined by Lazarus Feld and Merton in 1954. And it basically means that humans like to interact with other humans who are similar to themselves. So um, this is typical of most uh, interactions. And it's something certainly that, that people have noticed for a long time. So this is a quote from Philemon Holland in, in 1600. You know, birds of a feather flock together. Uh, ba basically, people who are similar tend to stick to other people who are similar to themselves. And let me talk, uh, I can give you some illustrations of this. So this is a uh, work, Peter Marsden is a sociologist who's done a lot of work in this area. And um, one of the statistics that he came up with is that when you ask people, who would you imp discuss important matters with? So you have something important you need to discuss with somebody, who would you talk to? And it turns out that only 88% of individuals have anybody else that they name who is of another race in, in answer to that question. So generally, they're talking to people of their own race and not talking to people across races um, when they have important things. Interracial marriages, this is US data from Roland Fryer. Um, only 1% of whites marry outside of, uh, uh, of race. 5% um, of blacks and 14% of Asians. So you get differences across groups uh, in terms of how much they're marrying outside of group. Um, obviously, different size groups can have different numbers here. Um, in middle school, less than 10% of expected cross-race friendships exist. So you, you, if, if you put down friendships at random, you would see certain patterns, and then you ask how, how much are people really communicating across race, um, less than expected here. This one's always a fun one. Um, closest friend, 10% of men name a woman, 32% um, of women name a man. Um, so there's, there can be asymmetries here, um, and, uh, but, but basically it's still less than the 50% that if people were, were randomly um, naming each other. And just to illustrate this, let me show you a picture from, this is a, another picture from what's known as the Ad Health data set. And this data set again is, is interviews with high school students, and now instead of being coded by by gender, these are color-coded by self-reported race. So this high school is a uh, little more than 50% white, about 38% black, and about 5% Hispanic, and then a few Asian. Um, and so in this case, what you begin to see, uh, and, and here what I did is I coded the links by um, strong friendships. So these are friendships where people have done at least three activities with each other in the last week. So they study together, they go to parties together, they have classes together, and so forth. And what you, what's fairly obvious from this picture is the whites tend to have friendships with whites and the blacks tend to have friendships with blacks. Um, the, there are a number of the Hispanics tend to be integrated into the other groups, and that's actually, when you look across, so in this data set there's 84 different high schools where we have full pictures of the friendships. And it tends to be true that very small groups are very well integrated into the society, but larger groups tend to segregate. So once a group bec becomes more than 10 or 15%, they tend to be become very introspective, and it's the small groups that then would find themselves intermingled with the larger groups. But obviously this means that there's gonna be very little interaction between two different parts of this, this school in terms of the, the student body. Right? So even though it's a racially balanced high school, it's not a, a, a well-integrated high school by any means. Um, this is uh, work for, uh, from India I'll tell you about a little bit later. We've been collecting data there for about six years. This is a village. This is village number 26 in our data set. Um, and here what we did, these are little dots are households. And what we asked them is, who would you go to to borrow kerosene or rice? So these are fairly poor villages. Often they need food or they need some means of heating their homes. 
Um, and so they go to borrow uh, kerosene or rice. And so the, the, a link here means that uh, one of them goes to the other to borrow kerosene or rice. And the color coding here is by caste. So in this particular case, the red are what's known as general or otherwise bad backward castes. These are, are the more advantaged castes in India. And the blue are what are known as scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. And scheduled castes and scheduled tribes are the castes that are targeted by the Indian government for affirmative action. So these are, tend to be the disadvantaged castes. And uh, again, you, you see the same kind of pattern. So you see that there's a segregation where most of the uh, forward castes are interacting with themselves and the other disadvantaged castes are interacting with themselves and there's less interaction across caste. And again, this is going to have consequences for behaviors and how things uh, spread it within a society. Okay. Um, this is another village, a, a village 48. So we have a, a, you know, a bunch of different villages and no matter how you cut the data, you, you tend to find these same patterns. And one thing, let, let me just say a, a couple of words about how these pictures are drawn. So uh, I, I didn't sort of arrange the dots to pick them, to put them red on one side and blue on the other. The way that this picture was drawn is it uses what's called a spring algorithm. So it starts by just randomly putting the nodes on the, pic on the page, and then it tries to pull together nodes that are connected. So if two nodes are connected, you think of that as a spring, it pulls them closer together. So it doesn't know the color of the nodes, and it tries to pull together the ones that are connected to each other, and then it draws the picture for you. And so it ends up picking all the blue nodes over here and all the red nodes on the other side, and it didn't know that, that certain nodes were blue and red. It was just arranging them to put the ones that are more tightly connected together. Okay? And so you, you end up seeing patterns like this where there's much less interaction uh, across groups than within groups. Okay? And this obviously is going to have consequences for information flows and other kinds of things. So, so let me say a little bit about the, the kinds of consequences. Homophily has a lot of consequences, and obviously we don't have time to go into all of them today. So what I'm going to do is give you one illustration, but they're going to impact spread of information. Who hears about new news? Does it come into a member of my group or a member of the other group? Um, adoption of technology, product purchases, and so forth. Uh, what I want to say a few words about is sustained differences in behaviors and beliefs. So this is, a, is something which is going to explain why it is that we can have very persistent differences across different groups over time. So um, this is actually uh, based on work I did with Tony Calvo Armengol, uh, and uh, we did this work uh, a number of years ago. So Tony, if, if you don't know, was a, a faculty member at, at uh, the Autonoma, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but we were involved in working on trying to understand labor markets and participation in, in job markets. And um, basically one thing that there's going to be a value to being educated and to being active in a job market, which is dependent on how many of my friends are in the job market and also educated and active. So there's all kinds of complementarities. If I have friends who are well employed, I'm going to hear information about jobs. It's easier for me to find a job. If I have friends who are unemployed, it's going to be harder for me to hear about j job information. It's less attractive for me to, to actually invest in education and so forth if I have uh, friends who, who don't have access to information. So there's a whole series of, of participation decisions that will be impacted by the friends that you have and, and their situation. And so the, we'll, we'll sort of put things together here. There's sort of three critical pieces. One is that the value of my investing in skills or, or doing something depends on what my friends are doing. The second is that then my decision is going to be based on if more of my friends do something, then I'm going to be more likely to do it. If fewer of my friends do it, I'm going to be less likely to do it. So the incentives then translate into d implications for my behavior. And then on top of that, we're going to layer in homophily. So now we're going to have t segregated groups that stay segregated over time. And when we put those three things together, you can see very different behaviors for different groups over time. So for instance, this is uh, labor, labor force participation rates over time. This is looking at males um, from 1970 through about 20, uh, uh, 2005. 
Um, these are, are males between the ages of 24 and 54. And what you get is the participation rates in the labor force um, by blacks is much lower than whites, which is actually um, lower than Hispanics. So you, you see pr patterns, and they're fairly, fairly consistent over time. They bounce up and down, but it's the Hispanics are investing more in, in being in the labor market, whites in the middle, and, and blacks at the bottom. The interesting thing also is if you look at females, it flips. Right? So for females, you, you have uh, black females investing more in the labor force, um, males, uh, whites in the middle, and Hispanics uh, at the bottom. And there's going to be a whole series of different cultural phenomena which impact this. But one part of this that's going to be important is understanding that, that having some insulation and homophily across groups is going to mean that the decision making within a group is not going to translate across groups. Right? So just to give you a very sim simple illustration, Let's look at two different groups that have homophily. So the green is in the yellows here. And they, they have a few connections across groups, but most of their connections are within groups. And now let's do a very simple thought experiment. Let's suppose that you're making a decision, and you just, you know, you're, you're a person who's very influenced by your friends. You do what more than half your friends do. So if more than half your friends do something, you're willing to do it. If less than half your friends do it, you don't want to do it. So you're just a fad follower, right? You, um, but this is going to be a proxy for a lot of decisions in, in getting education and, and which kinds of jobs you look for and so forth. And now what happens is let's suppose that in particular let's look at an example where I'm going to drop out of the labor force if more than half of my friends have dropped out of the labor force. So I don't want to be uh, in the labor force if more than half my friends are not. And let's suppose that for whatever reason two people start by dropping out. So we just seed this with a couple of people dropping out. Well, uh, what's going to happen, this individual now has two friends out of four, they're going to be willing to drop out of the labor force, right? So we've got this person drops out as a consequence of that. And now this person has two-thirds of their friends have dropped out, they're going to drop out, right? This person as well. So we, we end up here, and now we've got another person, two-thirds of theirs. So in this particular stylized example, it spreads completely to the yellows, but it'll never spread to the greens because most of the greens have friends who are other greens who are still in the labor force. Okay. And so what this means is that you end up with different patterns of dropout behavior, different patterns of education behavior and so forth that are going to be very difficult to overcome if you are ignoring the fact that their decisions are interlinked with each other. So they're heavily homophilized and on top of that, they're making decisions which are dependent on their peers. And that means you can have pockets of groups having very different behaviors over time. And in order to change that, you're going to have to change multiple individuals. So in order to overcome this, how would you have to do that? Well, you'd have to actually go in and get groups of these people to invest back in the labor force with the hopes that that would have some contagion. So it suggests, so, so part of the reason I'm emphasizing this is it suggests different kinds of policies. So the important thing from an economic perspective is understanding the social structure means that we should have different policies in mind for targeting these kinds of things than we would have if we ignore the social structure. Because individuals aren't making decisions in isolation, they're making decisions in ways that are dependent on other groups and, and people around them, and we have to take that holistic point of view in, in, into account in formulating policies. Okay, so that is a little bit about segregation patterns and influence on behavior. And the third thing, the last thing I want to talk about then is local patterns. So who you know and how that matters. Okay, so, so when we begin to look at, at specific positions in a network or individuals in a network, what can we say about how those things matter? Um, so uh, in particular, what I'm going to do is look at a question of how central or important are, are particular individuals in a society. So are there some people who are really key individuals in, in terms of, say, spreading information in a society? Okay. Um, so what it, uh, affects diffusion? There's this idea of viral marketing. You've probably heard this term before, that things spread by word of mouth. You get a snowball effect. The more people know about it, the more they talk about it, the more it spreads. But the key thing then is seeding this. Who, who are the first individuals you need to contact and how do you get this, this to snowball and to start? Okay. 
And this is a project with uh, Abhijit Banerjee, Runchandra Sikhar, and Esther Duflo. We actually started this work in about 2006. And uh, we've a, a bunch of things we've been working with. But what we did was we went into a series of villages in southern India. And we went in there before a bank was going to come into these villages and start offering loans. And in particular, one of the things that they're very worried about is that in some villages that they go into, lo the loan programs seem to fail. Nobody takes up the loans. And in other villages they go into, they seem to be fairly successful. So the most successful villages they go into, they get somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of the people to participate. And what they're interested in is, you know, how can they enhance the participation rates? What do they need to do to get more people to participate? And what we did is we went in before the banks went in and mapped out social networks, and we know who they talk to. So we actually know exactly who the individuals that they talk to in each village are, and then we can trace out the spread of information in those villages and see whether or not we can say something meaningful about who they should talk to first if they want to get information to spread in one of these villages. Okay? So let me just take you through that briefly. So the area here that we were working in is Karnataka. So it's an area just outside of Bangalore. Most of these villages are villages of about 1,000 people per capita income, about a, a euro a day, so fairly poor villages. They are villages all usually agriculture. They, they produce silkworms, other kinds of things, um, finger millet, uh, some pineapple. Um, so these are, are small villages and all within about 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers of Bangalore, but a few hours away at least, and fairly isolated. And what we did is we went into the villages beforehand and collected social network data. So for instance, um, one of the, this is a, a blow up of a picture of, a, of one of the villages. Each one of these little dots is a person. These bigger clumps are households. And then what we, this is the question we asked, if you had to borrow 50 rupees for a day, who would you go to? So 50 rupees is about a euro. Uh, who would you go to if you had to borrow 50 rupees for a day? And so they could answer, uh, you can't quite see the arrows on these links, but households then have connections between them. So we have a map of which households are connected to each other in this borrowing network. We also asked them, who do you go to temple with? Um, obviously not a very religious village. Um, um, but uh, who, who would you go to if you needed to ask advice? So we, we have a whole series of different networks. We actually have 13 different types of networks. And you know, who comes to you to borrow kerosene? Who would you go to in an emergency for medical help and so forth? And then putting those together, we have an idea of which households might be able to communicate with this, which other households. So this together gives us a network. And then what the bank did was the bank came in and actually looked for a few people in each village. They looked for the school teacher, they looked for shopkeepers, they looked for um, self-help group leaders. So they went in and, and targeted a few specific individuals in the village and said, look, we're coming, we're going to offer loans, please tell other people about it. And so in each village they went and talked to this handful of people and said spread the news. So these are villages where they, they don't have cell phones, they don't have you know, radios they're listening to and televisions where they can just advertise. So getting the news out, it was very important that they did this word of mouth. Okay? And so what we would like to know is how central are the people that they talk to and did that influence the eventual spread of the microfinance in these villages? So what, was it important that they pick the most central people? Okay? And how do we define central? Well, the, one of the most natural ways you would think of to think of the, the most important person in the village would just be to count how many links that person has. So somebody that has 20 friends, you might think of as, as being more influential than somebody who has 10 friends, right? So, so just do the simple count of the number of friends would be a first stab at saying who's the most important person. And obviously, you know, if, if we do that in a network like this, in a star, well, obviously the center would seem to be the best person to talk to if you wanted to spread news. They have seven connections, the other people have one. That's a fairly obvious one. Let's look at a network over here. Well, here it's a little more complicated, but you know, there's a person here who has six friends. They look like the most central person. If we had one person we could pick two to probably spread information, this person looks pretty well connected. Okay? So one thing we could do is use degree centrality just to count of how connected people are. 
and then look for you know most important people. Just think of those as best connected people. So whoever has the most connections on Facebook, that's the person you start the product uh, diffusion with. Okay. So what's wrong with this? Well, what's wrong with this is it doesn't capture somehow position in a network, right? So here's a picture where we have two different individuals who both have two friends, but they're really there's something much more central about this individual than this individual, and in particular. This individual is friends with a seven connection person and a six connection person, and this person is connected to two, two pe connection people. So we actually might want to capture information which is more holistic about the network or, or somehow captures not only am I, do I have lots of friends, but do I have well-connected friends, okay? So, so how do we capture this idea that we want more than that? Um, well, there's another centrality measure that has, it actually comes out originally of the, the uh, mathematics literature. But the idea is that, that the, the importance of a given individual should be proportional to the importance of their friends. So if I have important friends, I'm more important than if I have less important friends. So the idea would be that, that if we want to say the centrality of a given individual I, is going to be proportional to the sum of all the centralities of my friends. So just add up my, set my friend's importance, and that gives me my importance. Okay? Well, the difficulty now is we've got a self-referential system. I have to decide how important my friends are to decide how important I am. I have to decide how important I am to decide how important my friends are. So we have a system where we've got different equations and different unknowns. But the mathematics allows you to solve this. Um, and, and the solution to this is what's known as an eigenvector. So for people that remember your linear algebra, um, an eigenvector then is, is going to be a, a fixed point of this kind of equation. It's a solution to this problem. So there's well-defined ways of finding a solution to this, which tells us then how important are my friends, how important am I, and the most important ones are connected to the other ones. So this is known as an eigenvector. And interestingly, um, just a, a little bit of, of history, um, concepts rep that are related to this, eigenvector centrality, I don't know if you know this or not, um, the original Google algorithm for, for showing you important pages. So searches used to be done before the Google was a word. Uh, when you wanted to do a search, there were a whole bunch of different search engines, and you would type in something and say, I want to buy a computer. I would type in computer. And it would come up with a huge number of pages, and it wouldn't have any idea of which, one, which page it wanted to show you. For If I was typing in computer, I wanted to know, maybe I wanted to buy one. Which page should I go to? It didn't know. And what Google did that was different was it started looking at the Internet as a network. And in particular, what they did was they started ranking pages based on eigenvector centrality. So in fact, they, they worked with it and they estimated what the eigenvector centrality of the different pages were. So not just counting how many other pages are connected to it, but how many connections they have from other important pages. And they give ranks. So page rank, uh, named after Larry Page, the score of a page is actually proportional to the sum of the scores of pages linked to it. Now, th their algorithm has become more complicated over time. So Google works a little, more, more, uh, a little differently than this nowadays. But this is the basic way in which PageRank worked. Um, and you can do other kinds of models. If you randomly started on a page on the internet and started bouncing around, where would you end up? Um, most frequently, you would end up on some pages more, much more frequently than others. That's proportional to this eigenvector weight. So this is a way of keeping track of importance of, of individuals. Okay. So when you go back to this network we looked at before, these two different nodes that each had twos, this one has an eigenvector centrality of 0.3, this one 0.1. So in some sense, this one is three times more central, according to this definition, than the other one, even though they have the same number of friends. So this one is getting much more points because it has highly connected friends. And this one is the most important one in this network. It's 0.5, this one's 0.39. So once you start doing these, this is actually turns out to be intuitively a much better measure of how to spread information. You don't, you don't want to just hit a node that has lots of connections. You want to hit a node that is well connected to other well connected nodes. Okay. So how does this play out? 
These are actually the 43 villages we looked at. This is the average degree of the um, first people they contacted. So what we have on this axis, ranging from about 12 to 28, is how connected, what's the number of connections that the nodes are that they talk to first. So just counting, no, just counting links. And what you see in, up on this axis is what the participation rate was in the village in terms of microfinance. In these villages down here, about 7%. This village up here, 44%. There's n almost no relationship. In, that, in fact, it's negative um, in terms of the best estimate. So, so it doesn't appear that actually picking leaders or first people to talk to with lots of connections made much of a difference. But if you look at what happens when you do the eigenvector counts, if you look at the eigenvector centrality, now you get a positive and statistically significant relationship. Having better eigenvector of the first people that you talk to, if they're more central in this eigenvector sense, then you actually get much more take up. And this is fairly robust. You can do a whole series of controls on this. But what it does is it says that you know, identifying the position in a network actually made a big difference in the marketing. And in particular, it's a very special measure that you need. And, and in the paper, actually, we investigate the specifics of, of how you measure these things. But the idea here is you know, network information is very valuable in figuring out how to spread these things. It matters. And it matters in a very specific way. How you measure it is, is important. Um, so, so one, one thing uh, that we we're sort of following up on this. So now the bank asked us, well, how do we find the people with high eigenvector centrality? Um, that's not easy, right? So the, the last thing the bank wants to do is go door to door, survey everybody, create network maps, then calculate eigenvector centrality. Then if they're going to go to door to door, they might as well just tell everybody, look, we're here, we're, we've got microfinance. Um, so, so we tried to figure out, you know, how, what is it that identifies these people who are highly central? It turns out that if you just ask people, they're really good at naming who has high eigenvector centrality. So what we did was we went into the villages and we asked them questions and we said, look, if we want to spread information about a new product in your village, who should we talk to? And we didn't sort of ask them who has highest eigenvector centrality in your village. <laughs> I mean, they probably wouldn't have understood that, but, but they, they were able to answer this question. And when you, when you look at, so this is just uh, the people that they named most frequently. This is um, the, the, the distribution of most central people between 70 and 90% of most central. People named basically the, the most highly central. Maybe there's a better graph here. So um, this is sort of, the, the centrality of the leaders in the different villages and what people named. If you, if you just asked people who should we talk to and followed their recommendations, what would you have gotten out of the villages and what happened when they happened to pick um, really highly central people, you do as well just by asking the villages as you would by mapping this out and, and doing it um, very accurately. So, so people seem to have this ability to actually tell you something about their network and knowing not just who's central in terms of having most friends, but who's central in terms of being well connected. Okay, so uh, you know we've gone through these main important characteristics of a network. I, I've just touched on a few points here today, but what it does is it illustrates that a lot of our interactions are in some social context, and those social contexts have consequences. You know, more more dense networks can help spread things depending on the interaction structure. Segregation patterns turn out to be very important in understanding differences of behaviors across groups. Local patterns can be very influential in figuring out whether something takes off or whether it dies um, and, and understanding other kinds of things as to how people act in a, in a local level. So all of these things are going to be important. And now one thing I want to leave you with at the end is just a few numbers. So one thing that's happening uh, this, these days is the world is becoming more connected. And so this is just a graph of the number of internet users in the world by geographic regions. Um, this is estimated from 2012. So here in Asia, you've got more than a billion. Uh, Europe, 500 million. North America, 273 million, and so forth. So you're seeing huge numbers of people actually have access to the internet now. And that means they have access to, to email. They have access to things like Facebook, other social media, Twitter. They're going to be able to communicate with each other. And we saw that in the Arab Spring, 
a lot of communication going on via the, the internet, and these things can be important in changing the way that people interact with each other. And that's going to change our social structures. And you know, when you look at the internet pop penetration rates, you can also see you know, we're hitting 80% in North America, Europe's over 60%. And these things, if you look at the curves, we're actually at the rapidly increasing part of the curve. So if you look, you know, these internet usages, um, two th in 2000, the usages were quite tiny compared to what they are in 2012. So you look at the percentage increase in Africa, it's increased 3,600% uh, between 2000 and 2012. Um, you know, Europe, it's increased by 390% and so forth. So you're seeing huge increases and very rapid increases in the use of this and the ability for people to connect to each other. Um, so we've got ease of connecting to more people. But one thing I want to leave you with is this, there's actually two different effects that we have as this world changes. One effect is that we're going to become more connected. So you'll be able to maintain relationships over longer distances. You can keep in touch with people that you've met uh, and, and for longer time periods and so forth. But the second effect is that you have a better ability to find similar people. Right? So on the internet, you can find somebody who has a taste that's very similar to yours, who likes your hobby, who does what you like. And so that also means that we could have fragmentation. We could have segregation, more homophily happening. So at the same time we're becoming more connected, we could become more fragmented and more segregated. And so we have these two different effects playing out against each other. And we have both denser and possibly more homophilous networks forming. And so what are going to be the consequences of this? We have yet to see, but it's an interesting one to ponder as you go forth in, in understanding the world around you. And I, I sort of want to leave you with this. In thinking about the economics and other things you'll be studying over the next few years, think about how social structure and how humans organize themselves. How is this affecting the world around us? How is it having important consequences in economics and politics and social relations and so forth? So thank you very much. It's been great uh, talking with you. Tenemos tenemos tiempo hmm, para algunas preguntas. So if, if you have any question, hmm, so the speaker can still answer some of the questions, especially I would encourage students to ask questions. Okay. Any question? Yeah. I know. So thanks a lot. Any talks? Really, really interesting, thanks. I was wondering, um, thinking about one of the latest examples you showed with, uh, with the yellow and blue dots, so you were arguing uh, for good reasons that you had these two guys, both of, which, both of which have had two links, and but one of them was connected with more important people, so you wanted to weight them differently. Now, it struck me that another reason why um, the two were clearly different is that one of the two was somewhat the bridge between the two sub-networks, and so I'm wondering, I mean, I'm guessing that there must be ways of weighting how important you are in connecting sub-networks, like something like your influence in the whole network structure in this way. Yes. So indeed, there, there, are, there are many different ways of measuring how important somebody is. And in particular, what you're talking about, one way that you can begin to look at things is what's called betweenness centrality. And what between the centrality keeps track of is, if I look at pairs of other individuals, how many of them have a shortest path which actually passes through me? And then I become an important intermediary. If they want to communicate, communication between them sort of has to go through me. And so that, that would be a measure of, uh, a different measure of importance. And you know, one thing to take away from this is not that eigenvector centrality is the right centrality measure and always better than degree centrality. It's going to depend very much on what kind of application you have in mind. And in some settings, it might be that if, if it's a, a situation where there's important trade transactions going on, then being an intermediary is going to be very important. I become a broker. I become an intermediary who can 
can help facilitate interaction. And if, if it's a different kind of, inter it might be very different in a different setting. So whether you're trying to spread something like a virus or being an intermediary, it, it could depend very much on context. And, and it's amazing how many different centrality measures there are out there. Uh, so it's, there's a quite a few to keep track of. Yeah, okay, that, that was an impressive uh, lesson on social networks, <laughs> thank you very much. I, I also, I, I, I'm, I'm teaching, and we teach to the students Aigan values and Aigan vectors, and so many years ago, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine uh, years ago that uh, Aigan values and Aigan vectors would be so key instrument <laughs> to understand the connectivity <laughs> of the world, to understand, for example, the connections, uh, love connections among a group <laughs> of students and, and so on. So I, I was very pleased with, uh, <laughs> with <laughs> matrix algebra being a central tool for uh, disentangling the social network. But uh, having, having said, uh, yeah, about uh, this, uh, showing my <laughs> Thanks very much for that promotion, <laughs> 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 because we deal every day in the teaching. Uh, but also in this, you, you, you said we cannot go to the, uh, to the town in India and, and, and do a social network for other people. How about uh, the use of uh, sampling on that context, okay. which is what are we accustomed in the statistics? Right. We do sampling, and, uh, and how much sampling can disentangle the network of a town. Yes. Sampling is, uh, would be available uh, right, right, option. Right. Yeah, okay. yeah so, so one technique that people use of sampling in networks is what's called a snowball sample. So you look at a given individual, you contact a person, and you try to, so, so a, a prime example of this would be networks that are difficult to discover. So for instance, uh, um, illegal drug use, uh, and sharing of needles in, in, and spread of H HIV has been an area. You find somebody and then you ask them, you know, who are the other people that you've interacted with? And then you trace those people outwards. And the, the difficult part about trying to locate a, a network by sampling is you end up with a bias. And what's the bias? Well, if I ask you to name somebody who you're friends with, the person that you name is more likely to have many friends than few friends. So you end up locating people who are really well connected more easily, and it's harder to find people who are less connected. And so actually using samples to understand networks becomes a difficult enterprise because there's a bias in the structure of the, it's very, you, you have to really randomly approach people or understand what the bias looks like to try and to, to recreate the network. So there's some fascinating problems that actually have mathematicians and statisticians very interested in how to, how to do these things. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very active area of research now as to how, how to properly sample. And luckily we have, you know, media are, are dumping huge amounts of data on us these days. So you do have access to phone records, email records, uh, Twitter, other kinds of things. So there's a lot of information which is coming at us from other sources which also can help us map these things out without having to go survey people. Uh, okay, so may, maybe we have time for one more question since we have class and so uh, many students have class and we have to. Hmm? So any question? Well, we, if there are no questions, yes. If you have final words, well, first, uh, thanks you all for coming and especially our distinguished guest, Professor Jackson. Thanks again to our sponsor, Dr. Esteva. And finally, on behalf of the rector of this university, I shall declare officially open the 13-14 academic year. Thanks. <laughs>